This is a super video of the table that I did for the big build-off, the Nakashima-inspired one. So if you followed along and saw that entire series, you might want to skip this. But if you haven't watched that series and there's any parts of this build that you want more information about, I did a six-part series on it, so I probably covered whatever information you need in that series, and there will be links down below. Anyway, hope you enjoy this. I've had these sitting around for about a year now. Got them when I picked up a big load of walnut from an old sawyer. I knew and I'm pretty sure that they were sequentially cut or sequence cut, which means they're one after another. So I'm going to find that arrangement in the log. This is going to be my tabletop. So that way in the middle of it, I'm going to try to do a book match. So let me figure out what sequence these were cut in. Okay, very confident this is the way the board was as a log before it was slabbed up. Of course, some material was removed through the sawing process, and one of these boards I had some different plans for, so I took some material away. But based off the knots that are here, and then this big knot here and how those line up, and just the general curve and how everything comes together, I'm pretty sure this is the way it was. So let's talk unfolding this into a tabletop. So these two are going to be very close to mirror images of each other. You can see how all the character, well, this isn't plain yet, so it is pretty hard to see, but uh, it's almost a mirror image book match. Now, to keep this more appealing, what I'll also do is, the ones on the outside, I'll just pull straight out, and that is the orientation these slabs would be in. They might be thinking, that looks cool, Caleb, but what are you gonna do? Fill all that with epoxy? That'd be kind of gaudy. And uh, once you rip straight boards out of these, it's gonna be pretty narrow. Got better ideas than that. Um, but first step is going to be bringing the middle together. Um, I could fill this with epoxy, don't wanna do that. I'm just gonna, let me show you. All right, on these dudes that have to uh, meet together, we got a straightish line, have to joint this later, but you can probably tell there's some twist in all these. So first thing, take them all to the joiner, get a flat face, and then start planing them. Okay, first milling's done. Um, if you've watched my milling video or been around, you know I'm a huge advocate of doing multiple millings. This wood was twisted, had some cups. I think we're very close to flat now, but <clears throat> um, because I removed a lot of the fibers that was holding the wood in the position it was, it has to find a new balance. So they're gonna twist and they're gonna cup a little bit again. So if I went had gone to final dimension, I wouldn't have room to correct for that. So I just did, got everything pretty flat first time. I'm gonna let this rest a day or two, then I'm going to join it and plane it again to bring it back to flat. Um, by the second or third time, that should be good. Um, but first, the design. As you see, I'm gonna join the two middle boards on the flat. The way I'm gonna tie in these outside boards is I'm actually going to join them on a curve, which is a fun technique I've done before. So that'll be exciting to talk about. Um, I've design the base. I've been inspired by Nakashima's work lately. So I have, I'm gonna combine some elements to have two of his most popular bases. I've got my pick list ready. I'm going to try to pull down some walnut for the base to be a nice contrasting wood. Really like walnut and cherry combined and uh, hopefully don't hurt myself or kill myself getting that stuff down. I sorted through the best pieces and paired together the pieces I need that'll get laminated up. I have one extra of each. Time to start gluing stuff. Okay, these 
have had a few days to dry. You can see them, uh, I've got them elevated and they still look straight to me. So time to rip them to consistent width and the milling will be done. We've got all these milled up as well as all the material for the base laminated, milled up and ready to go. Making the top, including these curved joints, is going to be fun. First decision I have though is if you remember from last video, these two middle boards were book matched. I found out the sequence because all these were sequenced on. So they came out, they were in the tree like this. So to get the best mirror image, I book matched them. But I have all this rot up here, so I'm going to flip the whole table over, I'll lose the book match, um, but see if that looks any better not having this rot. Okay, you might have noticed that a, uh, th this end was wider on one side than the other. That's because they're not straight line ripped the same. That might have been, that. well, that was my fault when I did the track saw. So I lined up the outer edges and now I'm going to uh, rip this wedge because not only is the bottom one wider, it also tapers and gets narrower down here, which uh, is causing the issue. So I'm going to rip this again and that'll make a much better lineup. Now that I know about where my table will be, I can lay out where I'll put some dominoes just to help keep this aligned. Okay, the center book match is glued up. Rip the end so I can get a better sense of how to position these. Now, what I'm noticing is this end is a lot wider than up here, and accordingly, these boards are a lot narrower on this side. This one, not as much, that one for sure. So to try to balance out and have a more equal width, uh, I'm gonna ditch the trying to have the log unfolded with the book match and all the right sequences. And I'm going to flip this board, turn it around on that side, swing this one around over here so I can have the wider end where it's narrower, narrower end where it's wider. And I didn't want to like nail holes or anything into this because this is going to be my tabletop. So I got a quick clamp here and then spring clamp this piece of uh, eighth inch aluminum that's eight feet long that I keep just for stuff like this in order to uh, make my curve. And it was kind of popping so to set the middle. There we go. So to set the middle, I've got another quick clamp here, kind of holding it down, and that was uh, steady enough. Cut the slab to the line and then smoothed it. Now I need to transfer that to the template. So I'm gonna mark this so I can rough cut it. Okay, so I got the template how it needs to be in both my pieces that are gonna get joined or rough cut. Why is this so much harder than straight lines? Well, as you know, straight lines are straight, so if you have two straight lines, they join the end, period. It's really easy. <clears throat> Curves are an entirely different story. Okay, so ratter bit, small bushing. Imagine that's centered. Ratter bit, big bushing. Pretend it's centered. So remember, on that template, we want to cut the same distance across. So the idea is with this big one, we're going to cut. So if this is my template, I want to cut on this side here, because if this is my template, I want to cut here, because this is the same distance as this.
That's nice. It's gonna look good. So this is the configuration the template was in. It looks close enough. I'm just gonna flip this over for the mirror image. I'm gonna knock out this side off camera because you already get how it goes and uh, hopefully less mistakes this time. Okay, other side came together okay. I got this marked out for my dominoes. Um, so as I mentioned, these are uh, a little warped. I could have kept milling, but because of the amount of warp, the wood ended up a lot thinner than I wanted it to. So we're just going to try to pull that out in the glue up. Off camera, I noticed I had a little bowing, so I added these calls, which if you've seen my video on how to make a flat tabletop, um, calls are what I used without any dominoes or biscuits or anything, and I get really good results that way. This just helped pull it all flat, and then I end up turning it so I could close my garage door. It's had a day, so it's Sunday now, which is why I'm in my, uh, rocking my street clothes today. So time to get this unclamped and add some penetrating epoxy and stuff and start filling some of the voids so that stuff can cure. So this week I can uh, work on getting that together. I've got all the base pieces that I laminated before, but as you see, you know, nothing's trimmed to length, didn't even square the ends. So first thing will be squaring up all the ends on this, cutting its length and getting the joinery cut so the base can come together. We got Rockler's new miter gauge here, which is really sweet. I don't have the fence for it because they were out of stock when my order went through, which is fine. I'm just gonna add a fence and this is better anyways because I wouldn't want to cut through that, but I want a zero clearance insert to minimize chip out. So I've just got a piece of maple that I made sure is good and square to keep on my joinery square. Screw that on, get to it. Okay, first up, I'm gonna start cutting the half laps for the foot. This is zero clearance, so the handy thing is I can just line up my rule with the edge of the cut, slide it back, set my magnet to be a stop. Let's come back forward and check it, still good. All right, I am gonna make one modification to how I'm doing this though. First thing I'm gonna do is use my Rockler setup blocks to set the dado at an eighth of an inch. Okay, my dado stack only goes up to seven eighths of an inch, so that's how the wide this is, but I need to get it up to an inch and a quarter. So time to come back over to my test piece and I'm gonna use an off cut from trimming these earlier to mark the exact width I need because I'm not worried about the number, I'm worried about it matching. Get lined up, make a mark with marking knife, exacto knife in this case. I'm just gonna line up this line with the tip of the tooth. I think that's right. Set my magnet and give it a test.
I'm sure how this worked out was pretty intuitive. I just used an off cut because that was gonna be the same angle as a leg and this worked well to cut the, these crazy, whatever you wanna call this joint on the legs. Anyway, um, now that all the dados are cut, I can start doing the, um, you know, stuff that makes it all look cool. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, before I do anything else, I'm gonna drill the holes for the feet to go into while this is all still square. So once I have a giant taper here, it's gonna be a lot harder to drill. Okay, the base is coming together. Of course, the top goes on top. One of the problems though is right now my base is what I call an open shape. As you see, it doesn't, you know, have a continuous loop. So I need to close this shape because once the top goes on here, the force is gonna wanna push these legs out, especially because they're at an angle. So I need to connect the top. So I'm gonna do some stretchers here because the force they're primarily gonna be dealing with, they'll be trying to push away. I'm gonna dovetail them in so that way I have a mechanical joint resisting that force. All right, I think these are gonna hold. Not the prettiest dovetails, but haven't done them in about seven years and these won't be seen anyway, but they'll hold. I've got the arch on the top and bottom of the long piece. I also wanna arch the feet so with it together, I can mark the middle and then use that to make my arch. Next, I'm going to be doing the finish prep and finishing on all these. I'm sure you know there are some defects. I talked to the guy this is going to and they want me to fill it with clear instead of colored so they can see the natural bit of the wood. Before I do that, I'm gonna use some penetrating epoxy to toughen up all the weak punky stuff. And also that'll help make sure that the deep pour epoxy doesn't you know, leak through and run out by sealing everything. Okay, so when I was routing the second joint, the router, I pulled away from the fence some and got this gouge. Went ahead and glued everything up as normal, so now it's time to repair it. Because this clearly isn't an organic shape, I'm not gonna try to do like an epoxy repair or anything, and it, I don't have like a good grain match, so I'm gonna use some Timbermate to work on filling it up, and then um, use some trickery to try to hide it. Now this is pretty deep. As you can see, it's almost the full length so we're gonna have to do this in layers. So here goes layer one. The penetrating epoxy has really firmed up all this stuff that was just flaking away. I've got an off cut that I wrapped with some poly seam tape that I know <clears throat> the epoxy won't stick to. I'm just gonna hot glue the perimeter here so I can stick this on and make a seal. make a little dam around it so I can, don't have to worry about it overflowing too much. Okay, preparing for finish. Gonna be a lot of sanding, gotta deal with this epoxy, the wood filler I used. First, gotta get rid of our little dams down here.
Okay, that was the first pass with 40 grit because it's super aggressive. The goal there was just to flush up the epoxy, remove most of the excess wood filler, and get rid of the milling marks because my machine does kind of leave some tracks even with the helical head. So now that those are gone, gonna bump up to 80 grit, do it all again, and then look and see what else needs some touch up. I normally like to leave a lot of the inner bark, but this one just has a bunch of tracks. I think bugs got to it or something. So I'm just gonna shave it all down and sand it. Okay, I sanded through all the grits. Um, between 180 and 240, I stopped and spritzed the whole thing with water to raise the grain and then sanded it. I'm gonna use an oil-based finish, so some people say it doesn't matter. I just always do it. It's cheap insurance to make sure you don't have any issues. Um, but now to deal with some of these repair spots. Oh, one exception, the epoxy. Um, because I want that to come up clear, I sanded it through 800, which is what I have in my Abernet, and it's already looking good, so the finish will clear that up. But now for some of these touchier repairs. Okay. I'm sure you guys remember this spot from earlier. You might think you were close. We're gonna get really close. Okay, now this is a pretty good match, but it matches the background and we're missing these grain lines. So as is normally the case with my really fine projects, I had to raid my kids' art supplies and I found this brown pencil. That's fairly close. So what I'm gonna do is try to copy The grain line. There we go. Once some finish goes on that, that'll help blend it all together. Finishing a tabletop before everything goes together is kind of a no-brainer, but this table in particular is a great candidate for pre-finishing. I mean, I'm gonna finish all these components before I put them together, because as you can imagine, it'd be hard getting all those nooks and crannies. So everywhere the glue's going, I taped off because the finish is gonna prevent the tape from bonding very well. Um, so next up off camera, I'm gonna tack cloth and vacuum all the, the dust off so we can start finishing. But next time I talk to you, I'll be getting the finish ready. For this project, I'm going back to my old standard, Armor Seal by General Finishes, because there's a sponsor conflict with the stuff I normally use all the time now, which I still love. And you can see I'm starting with the gloss. I actually want this to be a satin finish, but this is a tip. Almost all finishes that are produced are produced um, as a gloss in their, quote, natural state. To make anything less than a gloss, they add flatteners. So I found you get a much better finish if you build up your coats using the gloss, which is sort of the, quote, purest form with the most clarity and then just top coat with whatever sheen you want because if you build up a bunch of coats of, of satin has more flatteners added you're adding those flatteners to all the layers and it gets a little muddy compared to building your three four layers with gloss and then just top coating with the product that has the uh, flatteners added and as always stir your product never shake it because you introduce micro bubbles and also these containers do a fantastic job of keeping all the you know purities out and keeping your product really clean but a great idea if you have any filters that you use for like spraying run your product through here so that way any dust that's in your shop that's collected on your filter you can add to your finish No, nope, that's it. I'm happy with the way that repair is looking. The Timbermaid I used looked a lot lighter, but once the oil went on it, it tends to take the color and it stains really well, so I like the way it matches. I'm just gonna let this dry, then I'll use 400 grit Abernet and my Marcus Sander on low to lightly abrade it and follow up with two more coats. Of course, the last coat will be the satin, like I talked about, building up with gloss, finish with the satin for the sheen that I want. The weeks of work finally pay off, get to see it come together. But if you've been watching close, you might have realized that there's two things I should have done before this point that I haven't yet. So let's get to that. Here at the bottom of my feet, or well, the table's feet, 
and I'm gonna use a threaded insert to do that. And what I should have done is push this in when this was a rectangle before I cut the taper, because I could have used a clamp to help push this in. So getting those in first, but first, before I do anything, these feet are too long, so I need to cut down this threaded insert. All right, <clears throat> so my concrete floor actually works a little bit better. And now that I know that, I guess I'm ready to start some blacksmithing since I've got this giant anvil for a floor. Okay, now onto the second thing. I don't have a way to attach the top to the base. I'm gonna use these Z-clips from Rockler again. I use them several times, I like them, but I need a slot to put these in. And because the tabletop will be expanding this direction, I need a slot wider than this fastener so it can slide with the table. I've got an eighth inch bit in my trim router and I did some test pieces and I've got this dialed into the right depth and the fence to the right distance. So I just need to mark my left and right limits on my pieces. These brackets are five eighths of an inch and this wood in a moisture change of about 4% across the year, which is pretty normal in a climate controlled house. Um, across the distance between these two points, which is about 14 inches, will expand a little over an eighth of an inch. So I'm gonna go ahead and go with a one inch wide um, slot. I was fairly annoyed when I was having to tape all these and then figure out what to do with the pieces while the finish cured. But uh, I'm about to be really glad I went through that pain, I think. Just hope pulling all this tape off isn't as tedious as putting it on was, but it shouldn't be. Anyway, let's, uh, let's speed up through this. Okay, I have uh, continue to prepare in an attempt to just delay this as long as possible and it's it's time time to glue put the base on the top. All right, got some Z clips from Rockler and the table's gonna move this way. So make sure these are set in the middle. There's one other thing I wanna to do to this table to make it a little more special for the people it's going to and recognize all the companies that have supported this project and making it happen. Well, there we go. I love doing this project. It was a whole lot of fun. Uh, it was very challenging. I learned a lot. Many more mistakes were made that I covered in the series and thought I didn't even cover there. Anyway, I hope you learned something, were inspired, or at least entertained. And until next time, make time to make something.